What's happening guys? Welcome back to the Ford Type Make It Loco channel. Uh, today we're going to walk you through some more AC diagnostics. And today we're going to concentrate on the uh, Ford scroll compressor with manual refrigerant control valve in the rear. Now this is one of the most, uh, probably the most misdiagnosed AC concern out there. I mean, especially in the Ford side, because Ford does not use any kind of refrigerant control valves in general. They use TXVs, uh, they use FOTs, but they don't use anything inside the compressor. So Ford decided to use these on the 05 to 07 Ford 500, Ford Freestyle, and the Mercury Montego. And I think they also used it in the 08 Taurus and Taurus X when they brought back the Taurus name. It's basically still a Ford 500 and a Ford Freestyle, just rebadged. Um, and they also use them in the 05 through 09 Ford Escape hybrid version only, okay? Now, the point of this valve is to make the AC compressor uh, more efficient, okay? It's constantly varying the amount of pressure in there. It keeps it on and it keeps it cooling, okay? The problem is eventually these valves will stick, and when they stick, they're done for. They're stuck. So the symptoms you get with this kind of valve when it fails is it's stop and go traffic, the AC cooling is horrible. You're cruising down a country road or something like that, cruising on the highway, and everything works just fine. How can it work then and not then, you know? Uh, so that's one of those things that's hard to diagnose. Now the pressure readings you're gonna get also are unique with this valve. Your low side pressures will be too high, and your high side gauge pressures will be too low, okay, because it's bleeding off inside of there. So here we go, we're gonna jump right into the diagnostics, all my pre-checks I give you. We're gonna show you how to replace the valve, and at the end, we're gonna show you what the correct pressures are with the new valve installed. All right, so the first check that I perform is a static pressure check. This vehicle's been sitting overnight, so our static pressures will be accurate. So we'll connect both the high side and the low side on here, and we'll just give it a look-see. So like I said, the engine's cold, has been sitting overnight, so it's at ambient temperature. And what you wanna do is look at the correlation between temperature and pressure. So our low side pressure here is at what, 84 PSI there. Look how it correlates to the inner circle here, the blue circle, um, the ring inside of there, that's temperature. So it's about 77 degrees here right now in the morning. So that all checks out. So according to static pressure check and it being, it's sitting overnight, we should have a proper charge level in here for it to work properly. Now the other check you wanna do while it's been sitting overnight is you, both sides should be equal. So you can see right here, both low side and high side are equal, indicates no blockages in the system. So it's all good information you can get just by connecting the gauges before you ever start the vehicle. The next step is to check dynamic pressures to make sure both the low side and the high side are in spec. So let's go ahead and do that next. Inside the vehicle here, before starting it, there's a few settings you wanna make on your AC control head here. Now on the hybrid systems, you wanna select AC, not auto or ecom mode, because the engine and the AC compressor will shut off while we're testing. Not good, you wanna stay on constantly, so you wanna select AC mode on there. If you have auto temp control, do not use auto. Make sure you select vents. So hit the vent button and it'll always come directly out of the vents on here. Same thing, we want control over the fan speed. You want the fan speed to be on three or four so we get that constant airflow and heat transfer across the evaporator in the dash there. If we don't, our low side pressure readings will be off. And on TXV system, it's too low. Um, I'm quite positive the high side readings will be way high. So you want that airflow, you want the system to run like you would down the road with air coming out the vents, okay? Very, very important. The extra step that I do is I'll put a dial thermometer in the center register vents here. It's the most accurate place to test for discharge temp. Discharge temp should be around 35 to 45, depending on your ambient temperature. Now, if you're down in Arizona, it's really hot down there. Maybe, you know, it might come out at 55, 60, no sweat until you get the heat load out of the car and then may drop to 45, 250. Don't worry about it. The temperature difference does make a big difference outside the heat load in the vehicle. Another thing to note here is look at the external temperature. You see how closely that correlated to that static pressure check we did earlier? Yeah, it's very accurate if the vehicle's been sitting and you know how to read it. Otherwise, static pressures aren't so accurate. So now it's time to check dynamic pressures. Go ahead and get the vehicle started. All right. Like I said, on the hybrid, you wanna select AC so the engine does not shut off. We're gonna put it on uh, the register vent so it comes out here. We get an accurate discharge temp reading. 
and then we're manually going to make sure that fan is, you know, a couple up there, three, four. Okay, now let's go out here and see what's going on with the manifold gauges. Okay. So you can see right here that our low side pressure is pretty good. 40, not so bad. It should be closer to 30 though for our outside temperature right now. It's pretty cool outside this morning. So we should be at closer to 32, 35. And our high side pressure here is a little low too. Usually it's around 150 right now. So all these are good indicators that the uh, refrigerant control valve inside of there has failed. Now let it run a little bit, let it get a little bit hotter. Like I said, it's ambient temp right now. And we're gonna recheck these temperatures, these pressures, okay? You can already see, this is basically staying way too low, being just over 100 like that. But look at our low side, not good. Not good at all. It's way too high, it's not gonna cool the vehicle off. So you can see the fans are coming on, you can hear them. We have airflow across the condenser, very, very important. So that's good. We know the compressor's coming on. That's good. We know kind of based on our static pressure reading that our refrigerant level is okay. Don't bother with that. But look at our dynamic pressures. Now imagine what these, these pressures are gonna be when it gets a little bit hotter. The engine carbon gets a little hotter. The ambient temp gets a little bit hotter. It's gonna be 55, 60, no sweat. It's not gonna cool, okay? All right, the vehicle's been running for five, 10 minutes now. Underhood temps have come up. And let's take another look at our pressure gauges here. So our high side, the pressure's still way too low. Basically hasn't changed. The low side, like I said, 55, 60, okay? It's gonna creep up and that's way too high. You're not gonna get the cooling effect that heat transfer inside the cabin. Speaking of, let's go look inside the cabin on here and let's see, I'm locked out of the car. Uh, let's go see what the temperature is coming out of the vents here. Yeah, about 70 degrees. So you're not going to really feel any cooling effect. 65, 70 feels like nothing when the car is 100 some degrees inside of here or it's 100 degrees outside. So you're going to feel, yeah, it's cooling a little bit, but not really doing much. Okay. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to raise the RPM to around 2000 or so RPM and we're gonna recheck this reading and the manifold gauge reading, and that's gonna tell us if that uh, refrigerant control valve inside of the scroll compressor has failed or not. It's a very simple check. Once we have the base readings, we can check it at a higher RPM. All right, same check. We're gonna to do this from the inside of the vehicle here. I have no helper. What we're gonna do is we're gonna raise the RPMs to 2,000. We're gonna watch the manifold gauge set. The most important side is the low side. So let me get it up to 2,000. 2,000, 2,500, somewhere in there. And then we're gonna check our readings on here. So you can see the, uh, the um, high side, again, didn't raise too much. Usually on these systems, it's around 150 or so, some of these TXV systems. Um, some are regular, like a regular FOT system, 225, 250, when it gets really hot outside. Again, the high side can vary. The low side, it, it's pretty much the same. Okay, you want to see the lower temperatures, so you see the lower discharge temperatures inside the vehicle. So we're running it a little higher. And this is the most common complaint. The vehicle's cool, it's really good going down the road, highways. You get it, you know, down to stop and go traffic, lower RPMs all the time. Mm, not so much. So right now we're kind of simulating um, driving down the road, highway, higher RPMs. Look at our pressures. So again, our, our, our high side is around 150, which is what you usually see for these. Cool. And then our low side just keeps creeping down. And it'll creep down further and further as we take the heat load out of the cabin here. So right now, our discharge temperature dropped big time inside the vehicle just by running at a higher RPM real good indicator that the, the scroll the scroll compressors refrigerant control valve has failed sticking and that it, it's allowing too much 
cross path between the high and low side. So this is a really good test and it feels nice and cool in here now already. Okay, so this little valve right here is what's causing all your poor AC cooling issues at idle, okay? It's called a refrigerant control valve. It's mechanical, it's pressure and temperature sensitive. So as you can imagine, being mechanical, over time, it can get stuck and start to bind in its bore. What's nice is that we, we can actually buy these separately from the aftermarket. They have come pre-assembled just like this, ready to go and adjusted. New O-ring on there, new housing plate gasket. And the one I I'm gonna link to down below is the Dorman one. It's about $35 and they've proven to be reliable. I know you guys are thinking Dorman, uh, no, no thanks. But you know what? These have proven to be reliable. And in reality, I think they're made by someone else. This one's made by Goo Deal and it looks exactly the same. So um, either way, these have proven to be reliable, $35, all inclusive, good to go. Now the hardest part about changing this valve is that you're gonna have to make sure the AC system is sucked down. I have my own machine, so it makes it very simple, but you are opening up the backside of the compressor, so you want the refrigerant recovered and pulled into a vacuum before you actually go ahead and pull off that plate. Now the plate on there on the Escape Hybrids is probably the hardest one to get to, um, whereas the 500 Freestyle Montego, they're right there, okay? So the compressor's gonna be right in front of the engine here, okay? And on the back side of it, you'll see this plate. 10 mil bolt and up in there, 10 mil bolt. Plate comes off, valve comes right out. So you can see on this one, the um, bracket for the oil dipstick tube is in the way, but you can turn this one out manually, pull that one out with a ratchet, and um, this plate will fall off to the side, and we can get access to the valve. It'll come right past this bracket on here, no sweat. So you don't need to remove the compressor, but you must recover the refrigerant. So it's a little hard to film up in here, so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna pull off these two 10 mil bolts. You see them right there on the backside of that plate? Pull the plate off, and then um, we'll get back to it and I'll show you how it comes out of there, how it looks. All right, now once that plate is off of there, you can see, you'll see the valve right there. I mean, either it'll be sticking out like that or it'll pop out on you. If it's sticking inside of there, you simply press on it and it'll kind of pop out like that. There is a spring inside of there uh, and that'll help get it out of there. It's brass, so you can't use a magnet to pull it out. So what you want to do is pull the valve out itself, and then here's that O-ring around the outside, that gasket on there. You want to pick that out of there and clean up the surface, and then we'll get the new one going in there. So let's see if I can do this. There we go. It's pretty far out with one hand here. I'll kind of show you it's tight, like I said. There it is. get it out of there and the spring will be attached to it so I should come out with it like that if not make sure you retrieve it from inside of there and you can kind of look up inside of there a bunch of passages and just a bore for it to sit in so we'll go ahead and replace that gasket we'll clean up the surface and then we'll come over here to the bench and we'll just simply transfer the spring to the new valve very very simple now what it should do is lock on of there. Just make sure you got it on there nice and straight and it should hold it for you while you're going back in. With all the oil that's on your hands, that's plenty to lubricate this O-ring and of course whatever's in the bore and you just slide it back in and start bolting up the plate on there. Just tighten these down hand tight and then we can go ahead and start charging the system back up once again. After that, you can pull in a vacuum and recharge the AC system so we can try it out. Now, once you have the refrigerant control valve installed, that's it. It's very simple, two bolts back together. You can go ahead and take your vehicle to your favorite shop and have the system pull into a vacuum, get all the air and moisture out of there, and then of course, recharge the system. Now, when I recharge these systems, generally, I put an ounce of oil back into it because when you pull the re refrigerant out initially, you'll pull about an ounce of oil out with it. So you wanna put that back into it so the system has the proper lubricant going forward. Now this one's fully recharged. You can see right there, so we're good to go. What we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and start it up. We'll check pressures first, 
and then we'll come back to the cabin and see how it's cooling. So let's go ahead and start it up, get it running. We're gonna do the test the same exact way. We're gonna start it at idle and let it run at idle. We're testing performance at idle. So right now you can see we're about 60, if not higher. Let's go ahead and make sure everything's correct. AC's on, vent, and medium high for the fan temp. So we'll let this system run right now and kind of get the heat loader out of the cabin while we go check pressures. So let's go over here and check pressures quick. Oh yeah, that's much, much better. You can see the low side pressures, you want them around 30 to 45, not 55 or 60 or higher like we were seeing earlier. This is where you want them to be. This is gonna make sure our discharge temp inside the cabin is much lower and we're gonna get that cooling effect. Now the high side is gonna be between 150 and 225, maybe even 250, depending on your ambient temperature. But the most important side is the low side. That right there, that's the sweet spot that's gonna get us the cooling we want. So let's go ahead and check it out and see how it's doing inside the cabin here. Feels much cooler already, even at idle. Let's check it out. So we're creeping down to 40 already. That's pretty darn good. So give it five, 10 minutes inside of here and it should be discharging around you know 36 to 45, somewhere in that area once it gets the heat load out of the cabin. Of course, it's not that hot inside of here, so it's not that bad. But you can see our ambient temp now has crept up to around 86 here in the shop. So it's definitely doing its job even at a hotter ambient temperature. Now, the interesting fact here is that the hybrids actually use the AC system to cool the big battery pack in the back. So if it's not working properly, the, the engine's always gonna be on instead of just being on to assist or cool the batteries because it cannot charge the batteries properly when they're too hot. It will bypass it until they cool down, okay? So the, having the AC system not functional on a hybrid will actually cause lower fuel economy. So it's very important, not just for your, your creature comfort inside here, like on the Freestyle and the 500 and Montego, but also in the hybrids here. It uses the same exact valve and it's very important. Hope this helped. I'll see you guys next time.